was um, some recent work in which we analyzed central compact objects, some of their properties, and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give you any answer, but just posing a question, which is whether they are anti-magnetars in the sense of uh, objects born, neutron stars born with very low magnetic fields, or buried magnetars or normal pulsars with normal uh, fields that have been buried in the initial hypercritical accretion stage after the supernova explosion. So just to introduce a little bit the, the field, uh, the definition of, of central compact objects is, to me, is not clear as many other definitions in astrophysics because uh, the, the problem is that observers, since there was a talk before blaming theorists all the time, <laughs> observers like to name a new thing, a new class, a new something, every time something flashes or something blows up in the sky. And I think in, in the bottom line is they are all neutron stars, or at least we believe they are all neutron stars, so let's stick to that and see if we can unify them without the necessity to claiming they, they have completely different properties at birth or completely different evolution. So CCOs, uh, we call CCOs to a class of, of neutron stars which are located uh, close to the center of supernovae remnants. Maybe if you go to the ATNF catalog, you get like 50 or 60 percent of them, which if you pick up only the young ones, younger than 20 kilo years, uh, about 50 or 60 percent of them are, are cataloged as CCOs. Their uh, characteristics are that they should have no emission either in radio or infrared or optical. They have no pulsar with nebulae associated. But the main characteristic is that they have very low spin down rates. So if you measure their period derivative, uh, it's in most cases you only have an upper limit and in some cases you have a measure, but it's very low, unusually low. So if you just believe that all neutron stars are just dipole magnets that spin down because of the magneto dipolar torque, then that means that the magnetic uh, field, inframagnetic field is smaller than 10 to the 11 Gauss, which is quite unusual, it's quite uh, on the lower side of the uh, PP dot diagram and the typical distribution of isolated uh, neutron stars. It's a quite normal value for binaries, but not for isolated uh, neutron stars. Then if you look at X-rays, they have a stable flux, which is usually thermal dominated, but the hotspot or the emitting area is small. They have a small hotspot with a small size of maybe one to square kilometers at most. Usually is well fitted by a hot black body component. And another characteristic is that they have a large pulse fraction. So the variability within the phase from the uh, maximum to the minimum in some cases could be up to 70%, which is a lot. Now, what was the, the interpretation of these sources? First, interpretation was uh, to call them or to believe that they are intrinsically anti-magnetars in the sense that they are born with such a low field. And this idea comes because, uh, well, it's, it's quite an old idea, but if, if you believe, which is, which is not clear, that the origin of the neutron star magnetic field is some dynamo action at the beginning, which has to do as well with the initial spin period, then uh, there should be a natural separation uh, for those objects which are born slow. If they rotate slow, all this, maybe this dynamo action is not very effective, and that was suggested by, by Alfie Bonanno and others, uh, maybe about eight years ago. And this inefficient dynamo action means that naturally you have a very low initial magnetic field. Of course, there could be other mechanisms to, to, to generate the field, could be just flux amplification because the progenitor, the core of the progenitor has a much larger field than usual. It could be some wind up of lines just because of a strong differential rotation or an MRI or any other mechanism. So this is unclear that this is uh, the, the only explanation. It has some advantages. That is the timing properties are explained in a natural way. You don't have to appeal to anything weird. You just say, okay, magnetodipole torque, very low P dot, very dot uh, spin down then uh, that means very low magnetic field and you only have to discuss whether or not the initial period is determining different tracks in the evolution. Um, however, there are some problems with this, with this uh, interpretation. One of them is that we have strong evidences for surface temperature anisotropies. As I said, we have a hot spot, which is a small size spot, 
and in some cases we, we even have inferred a large cooler area. And it's very unclear how you create such an isotropy in a neutron star which is isolated. If you have a disk and you have an anacreting system, it's okay, you have a natural way to explain this hotspot, but if it's isolated, uh, you shouldn't expect such a large degree of anisotropy unless you appeal to other effects, like for example, the existence of strong fields. In magnetar strength systems or submagnetar, like 10 to 13, 10 to 14 Gauss, you can create naturally such a large temperature anisotropy, but in a very low field object, you can't. Also, another problem is that the luminosity of some of these sources is unusually high and it's maybe one or two orders of magnitude higher than expected for uh, the standard cooling theory of objects of the same age. And a third possible problem is that in the pitot diagram, if you look where they are or where they are moving, uh, it looks like there is an underpopulated region. So if you do a population synthesis approach to, to study the statistics of the number of sources you find, sorry, then you find that they are less than expected. Anyway, so what's the second what's the second possibility? The second possibility is that immediately after the supernova or during the supernova explosion, the shock is still uh, trying to make their its way through the uh, progenitor envelope and exploding. But there is a lot of things happening this, behind the shock. There is turbulence. There is a lot of matter that could be eventually accreted onto the neutron star. And there could be some fallback <coughs> episode with hypercritical super neutron accretion lasting for know, weeks, two months maybe. And this scenario was, uh, was used to explain several observations in the context of supernova 87 8. Now, how much is the total accreted matter? It could be, it's, it's quite unknown, but it could be anything between two to 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minus one solar masses being uh, in an optimistic case. So that, that led some, some authors uh, some time ago, maybe 20 years ago, to claim that maybe neutron stars are born just with a standard initial periods or magnetic fields. It's just that the magnetic field is submerged, is uh, pushed back into the neutron star crust, and that will take a long time to reemerge. How much? We'll discuss it later. It could be anything between 100 or 10 to maybe to 10 million years in, in some limit case. I think it's gonna be less, less critical than that, but we'll, we'll discuss that later. So that is a completely different scenario because what we have is a normal neutron star with normal fields or even strong field uh, and normal periods and everything. The only issue is that the magnetic field because of this uh, hypercritical accretion episode has been pushed back into the neutron star crust. Now what we've done is, is just to revisit this, this idea um, using uh, multidimensional simulations. So we use 2D simulations involving both the evolution of the magnetic field and the uh, uh, heat transfer equation. So we have a, a coupled evolution of temperature and magnetic field. Uh, and for the magnetic field, uh, basically we add a resistive term. We add also a term due to the hot drift, which turns out to be very important and allows the magnetic field to uh, change the structure and, and transfer energy from higher order to, to, to lower to higher order multiples and also to create toroidal fields inside the neutron star. And also we um, mimic the effect of uh, accreting matter by adding some simple terms, some uh, adjective term here summarized in this simplified notation by V8 which is simply, it hasn't to be interpreted as a, as, a, as a real velocity, it's just a sort of settling or sinking velocity. So it's, if you just take the continuity equation, you can estimate how fast a blob of matter will be uh, sink into the crust as you pile up more matter on top of it. So we, you can perform some simulations with uh, in, in still in axial symmetry, so it's only 2D and see what happens with this previous scenario. So before I, I show you one or two movies, uh, I just want to discuss some uh, general uh, initial and final uh, pictures that we are going to find. So on the left, you will have some typical initial configuration in which we assume it's a perfect dipole, so there is only the polar magnetic field. 
and on the right it will be something that you can find at the end at the end of this accretion stage. So you, what you have is that at first look, if you look at the exterior of the neutron star, you see that the magnetic field lines are a bit uh, more separated, so that the external dipole appears to be smaller. And also, if you look at the uh, interior of the crust, which is this this uh, square here, is the crustal region amplified. You will see that there is a region in which you really uh, have a compressed uh, a lot the magnetic field lines, meaning that you will have much stronger fields in that area. So another important issue is that if you look at the mass of the crust, the total mass of the crust is of the order of 10 to the say minus two solar masses, but the outer crust only has a much smaller mass of the order of 10 to the minus four, so to the minus three solar masses, meaning that if you are able somehow to accrete such a small amount of mass, which is not much for the beginning of the neutron star life, when you have another 10 solar masses uh, trying to explode outside, then in principle you can actually replace completely the, the crust by a new one and push everything in. So it's not, it's not impossible. Okay, so the two main issues is that you will get first a uh, decrease, strong decrease of the external, apparent external dipole field and a strong amplification of the internal field in the crust. And that could be up to two or three orders of magnitude in some cases. Okay, so just to show you how it works, you have uh, how, how sensitive it is to the different mass. I'm showing two, two movies, two simulations. In the, in the, they have the same initial parameters. In the left one, uh, you, the total amount of accreted mass is 10 to the minus four solar masses. In the second, in the right one, it's five times 10 to the minus four. Uh, that shows how critical it is to have this amount of mass, which corresponds roughly to the amount of mass of the outer crust. So the critical line is if you are able to hit an amount of matter which is of the order of the mass of the outer crust, then you will have a strong difference before and after that point. Let me show it again. On the left, you will see that, uh, yeah, you have some external reduction. You have uh, some formation of structures in the interior of the Newton star crust, but it's not a terribly different effect. On the contrary, on the right hand side, I'm going to show it again, only five times more that mass led to the complete burying of the magnetic field, essentially. And then it takes a few thousand years to reemerge again. And once it reemerges, you have small scale structures, and eventually you will reach a similar value to the original one. Okay, so now if if you just try to put this in, in more simple plots, I'm showing here the evolution of three quantities, which is the, just the, the dipolar component, only the dipolar component of the magnetic field, which is the main responsible for the torque because higher order multiples are suppressed, the, their effect on the torque are suppressed as powers of V over C squared, which is very small. Then the period derivative and the period. Uh, the th different color lines correspond just to different accreted uh, amounts of masses, and in some cases, which is probably too small to be read, but there are a few different cases here in which I play with the geometry of the accretion flow. Some cases are nearly spherical, some cases are just accreting all matter in a small hot polar cap, say one kilometer size or something like that. So you can play with the geometry as well. But the general trend is always the same. For a reasonable range of masses, uh, you get that you can, once you reach this limit of accreting more mass than that corresponding to the uh, outer crust, you basically reduce the field, and even if you start with a strong field of the order of few times 10 to 13, you can really push it down to 10 to 11 or even 10 to 9, accreting a little bit more mass. Then the, this remains like that for a long time because the typical resistive time scale to dissipate the screening currents and allow the magnetic field to go out again is of the order of 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, so a few thousand years. So you always have to wait these few thousand years before the magnetic field reemerges. Once it reemerges, then if you look at, at the period of the period derivative, the period derivative obviously was very small or compatible with zero for some time, but then suddenly you can just go up and apparently have a 
low magnetic field neutron star. If you wait a few more thousand years, you will have a normal value. And the same for the period. The period is kept at the same value. Uh, for this particular model, we kept it for to, to 0.1 seconds, the same value it has at birth, doesn't change for a few thousand years, and then it still uh, starts uh, spinning down. Now, if you just translate this to points or trajectories in the PP dot diagram, that means that the trajectory is far from being straight line uh, corresponding to constant field evolution, which would be uh, a diagonal line going uh, from the top left down straight to the uh, down right side. Instead, depending on where you're born, you may have trajectories in which you will have trajectories in which these neutron stars can be born in some region down here. They can go up, and then eventually <coughs> you bend this trajectory and it goes down, and roughly you follow back lines. That's difficult to see, but if you look at instead of looking at the at the at the first derivative, you look at the second derivative of the period, which is related to the breaking index. Um, what this is is simply an apparent increase of the, magne of the magnetic field, meaning that it's a breaking index less than three for all young sources which are uh, corresponding to this, to this scenario. This is just one, one possibility. There are other ways to explain a breaking index less than three. The, the weird case is actually the, the, the exact thing. Okay, so the other observables we have beside timing properties are uh, temperature and luminosities. So I put it here, the, the CCOs are red, red dots here, the luminosities uh, and their ages. And the black and green curves are typical cooling curves corresponding to standard cooling theory of neutron stars. What I want you to look at this plot is that the black curves correspond to non-magnetized neutron stars or low magnetic field neutron stars, the classical cooling curves. There is some variability because of the equation of the state or because of the microphysics. There is a lot of variability because of the neutron star mass, as you can see the lowest mass or the highest mass. But still, if you look at the, uh, some of the CCOs, they are up here. So they are surely too luminous to be explained by a standard theory by, for the age. However, if you use uh, models of cooling models that include magnetic field decay, and therefore extra heating because of a strong magnetic field, magnetic strong magnetic field, then you naturally can reach much higher luminosities. So this first observable will tell us that the, uh, despite we see these objects with a very low dipole, the internal field is more naturally uh, assumed to be high to explain the high luminosities. The same for the temperatures. Uh, some uh, important features of some CCOs, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that they have a strong surface temperature and isotropy. Again, if you have a, an isolated object with a very low magnetic field, for example, the black line, you only expect uh, variations of temperature at the surface of the order of 10%, no more than that. However, in some cases, you observe variations of factor of two or three in the surface temperature between the hot spot and the equatorial cool region, wherever it is which is naturally accounted for when you have one of these strong magnetic fields. Uh, you can have uh, such a structure as, the, for example, the pink curve, which is a, a small spot, which is a factor of 50% or a factor, almost a factor to higher temperature than the average surface of the star. This is the case, for example, of Papis A or, the, or KES-79. For KES-79, there is also a recent paper by Chevaldas and Lai in which they fit some particular model atmospheres uh, with uh, magnetic effects, and they find that the best fit corresponds to models with a magnetic field strength of the order of 10 to 14 Gauss, which is uh, almost four orders of magnitude larger than the PP dot uh, estimate. Okay, so, I have plenty of time, so. My, my conclusions and some comments about this. Um, so what are CCOs? Uh, uh, are they really anti-magnetars or are they just uh, normal pulsars or even magnetar field strength neutron stars with very magnetic fields? So what I'm showing is that given an initial hypercritical accretion episode just 
following the supernova explosion. Uh, only accreting 10 to the minus 4 to the, to the minus 3 solar masses in an early uh, spherical way. That's important because if you accrete everything on top of the pole, you don't have this strong effect. You need a lot more mass. But if it's an early spherical, then uh, the results are not in contradiction with the CCO uh, features. So you can explain what you observe assuming it's a strong field neutron star, but the magnetic field has been buried. It explains timing properties, it explains the underpopulated region in the PPD diagram, and the AES, it, would be pre it would predict that all sources in this, in this uh, situation have all breaking indexes smaller than three for some time, for a few thousand years, maybe after 10,000 years it becomes larger than three because then the effects of field decay is, is, are important. And also explains in a natural way temperature and isotropies and large luminosities. Um, I'm not saying that the accretion is spherical, obviously. Uh, it is not. So but what we have is, uh, we have turbulence, we have mm, clumps of matter falling down at different places. What I'm saying is that in average, you need some irregular thing, not some channel accretion on a single, on a single uh, spot. This is another step in the, what we like to, to call the grand unification of isolated neutron stars, linking the different, all the different names that people have been using for different uh, uh, classes, which, which they are all neutron stars. So we try to unify them. Um, and there was, this would be the link between CCOs and rotating pulsars, rotation power pulsars, or magnetars. And uh, especially promising is to establish better constraints by measuring breaking indices, so better timing measures to go to the second derivative because that would be quite constraining to s discriminate between some of these moments. And then a final comment is about gravitational waves emissions. And I know there are also some people here working in gravitational waves. So if in a neutron star, if the B field is weak, that's very good for gravitational wave emission because it keeps rotating fast for a long time. You don't spin it down. The, the gravitational wave power goes as some high power of this the rotation period um, in the angular frequency to the sixth power. So, so you don't want it to spin down. And also for the detectors, you need to be in the right fre high frequency band. However, if the magnetic field is low, the formations induced by magnetic field are small, so you don't get a strong signal. On the contrary, if you have a strong magnetic field, you think you're happy because it's a, you can induce very large deformations and have a strong emitter, but then the star spins down very quickly, reaches periods of a few to 10 seconds very quickly, and that is completely invisible for gravitational waves. So in some sense, this, this uh, situation in which you have a very strong field inside, but a very low field outside so that the star doesn't spin down, is kind of the optimal scenario for, to look for, for gravitational wave sources because you can have something which is rotating fast and strongly deformed, but you can keep it rotating rapidly for a long time, so it increases your chances of detection. And I think I stopped here, just behind. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.